Where do I? I told Tanme that I would start to introduce him a minute or so before our announced, uh, well, before our usual starting time of 4.35, but I realized that I should probably spend three or four minutes just singing his praises for, for staying awake until the East Coast seminar time. He's in Mumbai, and if you look up the, uh, the conversion, well, it, it isn't possible to convert. It, it, it's some irrational sh shift, but uh, the the time is a very impressive time, and I'm very grateful to him for uh, for staying awake. Uh, it's also wonderful to see so many faces here. This, this is uh, the since the. Lee Group Seminar is accessible from anywhere now. The, the audience is uh, growing and, well, it, it's partly because it's accessible from anywhere and, and partly because we, we have an excellent speaker today. Tanme is going to speak about character sheaves on algebraic groups and that, that's five words, each of which I love. So I'm looking forward to his talk. Uh, you're still muted, by the way. Oh, uh, okay, should I begin? Hello. Uh, thanks, David, for the introduction. And yeah, it is indeed pretty late here, but that's good because uh, my son is asleep, so uh, that's the best time to speak. <laughs> so yes, so uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. So uh, let me just share. So I'm going to talk about uh, character sheets on algebraic groups.
So we work uh, over an algebraically closed field of characteristic P. So uh, K is the algebraic closure of a finite field, let's say, and we work with algebraic groups over K. And often we will assume that we also have a Frobenius map, F from G to G, which gives it a FQ structure. And our goal is to study the irreducible characters of the finite groups of the form uh, G of FQ in terms of certain geometric objects, which we call uh, character shields. Now let's look at this uh, uh, triangulated category of uh, conjugation equivariant complexes uh, on G and where we look, where we fix a prime number L, which is different from P. So character shields are going to be certain special objects in, uh, in this triangulated category. And these are supposed to be in a certain way, uh, some sort of geometric analogs of irreducible characters. So let's look at this category uh, DG of G. This is a QL linear triangulated braided monoidal category. The monoidal structure is given by convolution of complexes with compact support. So basically, if you have, if you have two complexes, we define that convolution uh, in the following way. We, uh, so we have these two objects, C1 and C2. We form their uh, exterior tensor product. And then we take the shriek push forward along the multiplication map. So this defines convolution with compact support. And of course, all the uh, operations here uh, so, for example, the shriek push forward is, in, of course, in the uh, derived sense. So, so with this operation, uh, this becomes a monoidal category. And uh, moreover, we have braiding isomorphism. So, given two objects, we have isomorphisms beta C1, C2 from C1 convolved with C2 to C2 convolved with C1. This is uh, because we are looking at equivariant uh, we're looking at conjugation equivariant complexes. And this gives us these braiding isomorphisms, which satisfy uh, certain uh, hexagon identities. And this gives it the structure of a braided monoidal category. So now uh, I'm working with algebraic group, but it will be convenient for me to pass to the perfectizations. Basically, what this means is that uh, once we pass to perfectizations, uh, maps like Frobenius become invertible. So Frobenius becomes an automorphism. But this doesn't affect the categories of uh, QL bar complexes. So uh, this doesn't affect the uh, DG of G. So uh, even when you pass to the perfectization, uh, the uh, DG of G for the perfectization is equivalent to DG of G of the original algebraic group. So, okay, so once we pass to the perfectization, okay, by the way, uh, I'll explain in a couple of slides later why it's important for me to pass to the perfectization. But, uh, but here, so after we pass to a perfectization, we can form this, uh, so we can, uh, so Frobenius becomes an, automorph uh, an automorphism and we can form this uh, semi-direct product. Uh, G semi-direct product, the infinite cyclic group generated by F. And inside this semi-direct product, let's look at this uh, coset GF. And let's look at the conjugation action of G on GF. Now, if the group is connected, then Lang's theorem says that this action is transitive. So if we look at the, so here we have this uh, GF and the conjugation action of G on GF. So if you look at this equivariant derived category on the left hand side here, it's equivalent uh, because the action is transitive. This is equivalent to uh, the uh, represent the derived category of representations of a stabilizer. And if we look at the stabilizer of the point F, which lies in this coset GF, then the stabilizer is exactly the fixed points of Frobenius. So we have this equivalence of uh, triangulated categories. So basically, we can think of representations. I mean, we can think of an object in this triangulated category as 
being a representation or uh, as being a complex of representations now if the group is disconnected of course the uh, action is no longer transitive but still there are finitely many orbits and here uh, so what i've written here so on the left hand side is the same is the uh, so let's see what this category is in for disconnected groups so on the right hand side we see that some pure inner forms of the frobenius appear so uh, so here g this small g is an element of the group so by gf i mean uh, you apply the frobenius and then uh, uh, conjugate by g so this is frobenius twisted by the conjugation of this element little g so this gives another frobenius so if the group is disconnected then this category on the left hand side is equivalent to the direct sum of the derived categories of representations of all the pure inner forms so basically uh, when we deal with disconnected groups it's natural to uh, look at all pure inner forms at the same time and even though one might be interested only in connected groups uh, the proofs of many results are inductive in nature and so many times we have to pass to disconnected groups like centralizers of certain things or uh, normalizers of certain objects and that's why it's important to consider uh, disconnected groups right from the beginning okay so now uh, if we look at this category of uh, dg or gf uh, it's a pi module category over this braided module basically we can so uh, just like we defined convolution in dg of g we can define a module structure on this category dg of gf uh, uh, by the same way by a similar sort of a diagram and so with this this category dg of gf becomes a bimodule category over this braided monodule category and now if we take an object c in dg of g and an object m in dg of gf we have a sort of braiding isomorphisms which i call crossed braiding isomorphisms so uh, beta is from so beta c comma m is from c convolved with m to m convolved with c and beta m comma c is m con, uh, is an isomorphism from m convolved with c to the frobenius pullback of c convolved with m so this is so these isomorphisms i call crossed braiding isomorphisms and uh, so the construction of these isomorphisms is similar to the construction of the braiding isomorphisms that hold just for this category dg of g so so now suppose that we have an object c in the category dg of g which is stable under the frobenius so let's say we fix an isomorphism between the frobenius pullback of c and c so psi is an isomorphism between uh, the frobenius pullback of c and c then we can uh, get the following automorphism by composing so from c convolved with m to m convolved with c that's the map beta c comma m from m the, so the next map is beta m comma c and finally the last map comes from this isomorphism between the frobenius pullback of c and c so whenever we have uh, so c in dg of g which is frobenius stable we can construct such an automorphism in dg of gf so uh, now let me come to the sheaf to function correspondence so if we have an object in dg of g and if we have an automorph uh, an equivalence of this with its frobenius pullback then there is the sheaf to function dictionary and we can define a class function on the group 
moreover uh, uh, basically what this construction does is it gives a class function on, on each of the pure inner forms so if you have an isomorphism between the frobenius pullback of an object and itself then we get a class function on each pure inner form so basically i'm denoting this function by trace c comma psi and this uh, function space is the space of is the direct sum of the space of class functions on all the pure inner forms so so basically we we are interested in studying this space the space of class functions on all the pure inner forms so we call an object of dg of g simple if the algebra of endomorphisms of this object is one dimensional now if such now if such an uh, okay now if a, such a c is simple and it is also f stable then the trace function is determined by c up to scaling because the endomorphism algebra is just uh, one dimensional so this trace function is well defined up to a scaling if the object c is simple on the other hand uh, suppose we have an object m in dg of gf now remember that an object here is something like a representation of a pure inner form so if we have an object here we can think uh, so we think of it as a complex of representations and we can define its character which is again a function in this function space so it is a character uh, it's a class function on some pure inner form so now the question is given an irreducible character of some pure inner form does there exist a simple does there exist a simple uh, f stable c such that this character can be obtained as the trace of frobenius function using the sheaf 2 function correspondence and of course the answer is not always but then we try to go as close as possible so we would like to uh, study these characters of irreducible representations so these are chi ms are the characters of the irreducible representations we would like to study them in terms of the trace of frobenius functions so uh, let me state the first theorem so suppose you have a, an object c in dg of g which is uh, equipped with an isomorphism with its frobenius pullback yeah uh, so uh, and m is a representation essentially m is in dg of gf so we have the character of m and we have the trace function associated with c then the inner product is given by uh, so let me go back here so remember that we constructed this automorphism so this is an automorphism in this category of representations and in fact uh, so in this category of representations we can take trace and this is essentially what i'm doing on the right hand side here i'm taking the trace of this automorphism and i'm normalizing it in a certain way this is the normalized trace of this automorphism and here i have the inner product of the these two class functions so that's the first uh, relationship that we have between these two types of class functions so on the one hand we have this class function which comes from dg of g and on the and on the other hand we have this character so for example a corollary of this result is that uh, let's say g is a reductive group uh, so in this case uh, lustig has defined the th uh, character sheaves and uh, so in this case If a corresponding to a character sheaf, Lustig has associated a semi-simple element in the 
or a semi simple conjugacy class in the dual reductive group and similarly given an irreducible character uh, lustig has associated a semi simple class in the dual or uh, in the dual uh, reductive group now suppose we have an irreducible character chi m sorry and could you remind me over what field these the dual group is it's uh, over the same finite field it's over the same field so yes so this is the uh, uh, langlands dual group but defined over the same field now suppose you have a irreducible character chi m and a character sheaf which correspond to different semi simple conjugacy classes then as a corollary you get that this inner product is zero which basically means that in this character so these character sheaves do not appear in this character uh, as long as the character as long as the two things correspond to different semi simple uh, conjugacy classes and the, uh, and this is because in this case if the semi simple uh, conjugacy classes are different then c converged with m uh, one can show that this convolution is zero so essentially this uh, morphism is zero and hence this trace is zero so uh, so let me now formulate some conjectures about character sheaves so we want to define character sheaves in this category and so the conjecture says that there is a, a set called cs of g which stands for character sheaves on g of isomorphism classes of certain simple objects which should satisfy uh, certain conditions so let me just spell those expected uh, uh, conditions that these this set of character sheaves should satisfy so first of all the uh, the set of character sheaves should be partitioned into certain finite families known as l packets so here this this l stands for uh, lustig because uh, lustig defined such a partition for reductive groups so so here this uh, bold lg it it is the set of all l packets and so we want a partition of the set of character sheaves into this uh, uh, lustig packets and each lustig packet should be finite moreover associated with each lustig packet there should be a modular fusion category whose simple objects are the corresponding character sheaves so basically this modular fusion category stru uh, structure should come from some sort of truncated convolution of character sheaves so basically if you take let's say let's work uh, over reductive groups if we take two character sheaves then their convolution contains uh, character sheaves from different lustig packets however it's possible to define a truncated convolution which lies within the same lustig packet so associated with each lustig packet we hope that we can define some sort of truncated convolution and this truncated convolution will give it a modular uh, fusion the structure of a modular fusion category now suppose we have a braided triangulated auto equivalence so phi is a braided triangulated auto equivalence then we want that it should preserve the set of character sheaves and it it should also preserve the l packet decomposition so a typical example of this phi is like pullback by frobenius so pullback by frobenius is a braided triangulated auto equivalence so we would like to have uh, the set of character sheaves as well as the l packet uh, decomposition be uh, preserved by any braided triangulated auto equivalence moreover uh, for any l packet so uh, 
So associated with this L packet, I'm calling the mo uh, modular fusion category CL. So moreover, this uh, T should induce an equivalence of modular categories from CL to C P of L. And in particular, this should hold for uh, pullback by Frobenius. Uh, so which is the uh, which is the auto equivalence which are which we are most interested in. Now, let's look at the set of so this uh, so the previous conjecture say that Frobenius preserves the set of character sheaves. So let's look at a fixed point. Uh, so let's look at a character sheaf which is fixed by Frobenius, and let's fix an isomorphism between the Frobenius pullback and C such that the trace of the associated function, uh, sorry, such that the norm of the associated trace function is one. So we can choose an isomorphism in such a way that the norm of this function is one. Then uh, we expect that these functions form an orthonormal basis of the set of class functions on all the pure inner forms. So the F stable character sheaves, they give rise to an orthonormal basis of the uh, of the space of class functions on our, all the pure inner forms. Now, of course, uh, the irreducible characters of all the pure inner forms that gives uh, that gives another basis of uh, that gives another orthonormal basis of these class functions, and then our uh, aim is to uh, define the real uh, study the relationship between these two. Uh, so, so then the claim is that this essentially uh, the change of basis matrix between these two bases is a block matrix parameterized by these uh, loose stick packets. Uh, and okay, so the last part of this conjecture gives an explicit description of these blocks. So as I said, associated with any L packet, we expect there is a, a modular fusion category. Now given a modular fusion category, there is a notion of an S matrix, which is a unitary matrix. But now we are looking at a L packet, which is fixed by Frobenius, and hence Frobenius induces an auto equivalence of this modular category. Now, if we have a modular fusion category equipped with an auto equivalence, uh, then uh, there is a notion of a crossed S matrix associated with this pair. So essentially, uh, and the cross S matrix is also a unitary matrix. So the conjecture is that these cross S matrix the relationship between character sheaves and character sheaves. Can I ask oh, how unique are, I mean, you, you began with this isomorphism size of C with yes. some normalization property, which makes yes. it sound like there's a little bit of choice. Uh, yes. And well, how do these matrices change if you change yes. the choice? Yes, yes, yes. So indeed, this uh, the, in the definition of a uh, cross S matrix, the, uh, so cross S matrix uh, is only defined again up to uh, rescaling the rows by uh, certain scalars. And in the definition of the cross matrix, also some choice of an isomorphism is involved. And this is exactly the choice. Uh, so basically, yeah. So the uh, uh, yeah the cross S matrix also depends on certain choices. So that's the uh, yeah. So and uh, essentially we can uh, make this choice up to some uh, roots of unity. So. Uh, yes, so of course, these conjectures are motivated by the work of Lustig on reductive groups and the work of Koyash and Kodrinfeld on uh, unipotent groups. So some parts of this conjecture are known for reductive groups, but 
uh, not all parts. So there are some, uh, I mean, many of these points are still open for reductive groups. For example, so, uh, the first two statements are uh, known for reductive groups. However, I, I, I believe the third statement is still open for reductive groups. And uh, of course, these relations, the relationship between characters and character sheaves is also known uh, in certain cases, but I, I guess it's not known in complete generality. So, although, well, uh, you know, uh, this uh, many, uh, a large part of these conjectures are known for reductive groups by the work of Lustig, Shoji, and others. Uh, some points are still open. Uh, however, if you look at unipotent or solvable groups, then uh, so uh, so suppose uh, G is an algebraic group such that the neutral connected component is solvable. Then conjecture one uh, holds for such a group. So uh, so. Uh, so unlike reductive groups, uh, in this case, we know all of the conjecture. Yes, and one point I would like to mention is that uh, for reductive groups, as well as unipotent groups, character sheaves are uh, perverse sheaves, at least up to a shift. But in general, we do not expect uh, character sheaves to be perverse. For example, for solvable groups, there do exist non-perverse character sheaves, and we'll see some examples uh, towards the end. Could you say something about, even in the case of unipotent groups, what kinds of representations are in question here? Uh, what kind of? Representations so, of G. So we are looking at representations of uh, G of FQ over uh, QL closure. So we are uh, looking at, uh, so if you have a unipotent group, essentially this will be some uh, P groups. And we are looking at representations of these over uh, a field of characteristic zero, so QL closure. So, uh, so let me, so next, I'll give some idea about the proof of this theorem and also an approach towards pro proving the conjecture in general. So, so basically the, we, we aim, so this category DG of G is a complicated uh, triangulated braided monoidal category, but we hope to break it into more manageable pieces using what we call minimal idempotence in this uh, monoidal category. So an idempotent is something so that f convolved with f is isomorphic to f. So that's an idempotent and uh, so minimal idempotent means that uh, if we look at any other idempotent then e convolved with f should either be zero or it should be f. That's a minimal idempotent. So basically, we uh, hope to uh, look at minimal idempotents in this category. And if we have a minimal idempotent, then uh, we can look at uh, f convolved with d g of g. This is a sub. This is a certain full subcategory of d g of g, and this is itself a braided uh, triangulated category of, uh, and of course the unit object here is f. So we aim to first study this category and define character sheaves in this smaller category. Uh, so uh, and then uh, uh, do this for all minimal idempotents. Uh, now there are some special idempotents which can be described uh, explicitly in terms of unipotent subgroups which are known as Heisenberg idempotents. So I'll give uh, 
more details about this in a couple of slides. But there are some identity portents which can be defined explicitly, uh, known as Heisenberg identity So we conjecture that Heisenberg identity are in fact minimal. And moreover, we conjecture that any minimal idempotent can be obtained from a Heisenberg idempotent on a sub subgroup of G by an induction procedure. So essentially, uh, we hope to reduce the conjecture to the case of Heisenberg idempotents. So let me uh, go on and describe what is a Heisenberg idempotent and how uh, we can hope to uh, reduce to this case. So let me begin by describing multiplicative local systems. So multiplicative local systems are the simplest type of character sheets. They are analogs of one dimensional characters. So multiplicative local system is uh, a local system L so that the pullback by the multiplication map is isomorphic to uh, the exterior tensor product of L with itself. So here uh, I'm taking G to be a connected algebra group. Uh, so uh, the notion of multiplicative local system is more is most natural for connected algebraic groups. Now, if uh, so, uh, if L is a multiplicative local system on G, where G we assume to be connected, then we can see that we can compute the convolution and see that the convolution is essentially the uh, if the uh, cohomology of comp cohomology with compact support of g tensored with l so this uh, cohomology with compact support we consider it as a uh, complex of uh, vector spaces tensored with l so basically this means that this is not quite an idempotent because there is this cohomology here but uh, this is what i call as a uh, quasi idempotent uh, what is more natural for me is to, uh, so if we have a multiplicative local system, I tensor it with the dualizing sheaf on G. So basically, I shift it by twice the dimension and I apply a state twist by the dimension of G. So essentially, once you do this, now suppose G also happens to be unipotent, then EL will in fact be a minimal idempotent in this if we have a so whenever you have a multiplicative local system on a unipotent group you get a minimal idempotent uh, however if g is not unipotent then el is a minimal uh, quasi idempotent but uh, for, for some time let me uh, focus on unipotent groups so suppose u is a connected unipotent group then the moduli space of multiplicative uh, local systems is actually well defined as a perfect commutative unipotent group over the same field. Uh, uh, so this is known as the Serre dual of U. And this is the reason uh, that I pass to perfectization because the, this uh, U star is uh, only defined as a perfect it's only defined in the world, world of perfect uh, unipotent groups. So, uh, given any connected unipotent group, we have its shared dual U star, which is a perfect and commutative unipotent group. So, so note here that, okay, yeah, uh, yeah, and by the way, so here, uh, so you can take the shared dual of uh, even a non commutative group. But if you restrict Serre duality to commutative, uh, perfect commutative unipotent groups, then this uh, Serre duality becomes an exact anti involution. So basically, the Serre dual of the Serre dual is naturally identified with U. So U star star is naturally identified with U. So in some sense, we have very much like uh, contragent duality for finite groups. Now for non-commutative groups, 
the uh, the shared dual may be disconnected uh, and however we can uh, describe the neutral connected component of the shared dual and this is the same as the shared dual of the abelianization so uh, uh, one might expect that the uh, uh, you know the shared dual one might expect the shared dual of u to be the shared dual of the abelianization but this is not quite true in general what is true is that the uh, neutral connected component of the shared dual is the shared dual of the abelianization so now let me uh, define something known as an admissible pair so here uh, uh, g is any algebraic group now we look at pairs h comma l where h is a connected uh, unipotent subgroup and l is a multiplicative local system on h so basically we are interested in pairs where of a, a connected unipotent subgroup and a, a multiplicative local system on that and by uh, g prime so now uh, g act on all such pairs by conjugation so we look at the stabilizer or the normalizer of such a pair so g g prime is the normalizer of this pair and we define el to be l tensored with the uh, dualizing complex on h so uh, so one can check that this is an idempotent in this uh, conjugation equivalent category for dg uh, prime so basically since l is norm uh, since l is equivalent for the action of g prime that's why uh, it lies in the equivalent derived category for the action of g prime uh, now suppose that we have such a pair and moreover for every g Uh, which for every small g uh, lying in uh, which does not lie in the uh, in g prime suppose that this convolution so here this delta g is the delta sheaf supported at g so uh, so so for any g which does not lie in g prime look at this convolution el convolved with delta g convolved with el so suppose this convolution is zero for all such g so this is equivalent to the condition that the restriction of l to h intersection the conjugation of h not being isomorphic to uh, the you know the uh, Uh, conjugated uh, l restricted to, to this same so this is uh, reminiscent of the uh, mackey criterion of irreducibility and i call this the geometric mackey condition so if a pair satisfies this geometric mackey condition then let us induce this idempotent from g prime to g so uh, so so there is this fun functor called induction which goes from this the conjugation equivalent category for the subgroup to the uh, conjugation equivalent category of the group now if this pair satisfies this geometric mackey condition then the induced uh, object is also an idempotent in this and moreover induction defines a braided triangulated equivalence between these so basically uh, so you get so this braided uh, category is equivalent to this uh, category corresponding to a smaller group now in addition to the above suppose okay so uh, so now we have this g prime and i let u be the unipotent radical of g prime 
and so then uh, it's clear that uh, H will be a normal subgroup of U. And sorry, w was H assumed to be normal in G? No, H is normal in G prime. So uh, uh, so U is the unipotent radical of G prime. And uh, so G prime uh, normalizes the pair H comma L. In, per in particular, H is normal uh, normal in G prime. So, so the unipotent, yes, so, so in addition to this, let's assume that U modulo H is commutative. Uh, okay, so basically what this means is that if we look at the commutator map from U cross U, it in fact, it, it uh, maps to H. Now, uh, so using the multiplicative local system L, we can construct a homomorphism from uh, U mod H to the shared dual of U mod H. So, uh, uh, so let me just say a few words about this construction. So let's pretend that U and H are uh, uh, finite groups such that U mod H is uh, commutative. And suppose that you have a character of H you have a one dimensional character of H, uh, which is uh, uh, invariant under the conjugation action of U. Then uh, uh, you can get a map from uh, U mod H to the Pontryagin dual of uh, U mod H, which we can think of as a, a pairing between uh, U mod H uh, cross U mod H to uh, the multiplicative group of the field. So this is just a geometric analog of this construction. Uh, and moreover, uh, this, uh, you know, this pairing, so this should, uh, is uh, Q symmetric. Uh, if we, uh, you know, go to the setting of, you know, if you pretend that these are finite groups, then the pairing that you get is Q symmetric. And we have analogs of all this in this case. So, so we say that this pair H comma L is an admissible pair if this, uh, this homomorphism of commutative uh, unipotent groups uh, is an isogeny. So, uh, and uh, if we have an admissible pair so that G prime is equal to G. Sorry, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So um, I just want to um, ask about a particular example. So if, if I take something like, um, and I take uh, um, H to be, oh, oh okay, wait, oh, so maybe I, uh, if, if I take G to be um, the Heisenberg group for triangular unipotent by three yes. and yes. H I take to be the corner. Yes. So yes. And I'm in the K mod H commutative. Yes. Yes. For what central characters is uh H L and admissible pair? Is that gonna be all non trivial? Non trivial, yes. Actually yes I, uh, so the trivial I one does to come to this example. So uh, I have this example in my slides later on. So Okay, I, sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So it is the uh, yes. It it has to be the non-trivial character. That's it. Exactly okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So uh, yeah. So let me uh, say some conjectures about these admissible pairs. So uh, so uh, remember that when uh, if we have an admissible pair, we uh, by the second point here. We, ha uh, we have an idempotent FL in DG of G. So the first part of the conjecture two says that uh, if HL is an admissible pair, then the idempotent that we constructed is actually a minimal idempotent in DG of G. That's the first part of the conjecture. And the second part says that any minimal idempotent 
is obtained in this way. So given any minimal idempotent, there exists an admissible pair uh, such that F uh, can be obtained from this admissible pair. So, uh, so yes, so this is a conjecture. And let me state conjecture two prime. So conjecture two prime says that a Heisenberg idempotent is a minimal idempotent. So as you can see, this conjecture two prime is a special case of uh, the first part of conjecture uh, two. So conjecture, the first part of conjecture two clearly implies conjecture two prime. Uh, and it's not hard to see that, in fact, uh, conjecture two prime is equivalent to uh, uh, the conjecture to the first statement of uh, conjecture two. However, uh, uh, let me state a theorem which says that conjecture two prime implies conjecture two. So basically, another way to say this is that the first part of conjecture two implies the second part of conjecture two. So that's what I'm claiming here. That's a, that the uh, this so the conjecture two. Uh, notice that conjecture two is only about Heisenberg idempotents. So, and uh, the next part of the theorem is that these conjectures are true if the neutral connected component of G is solvable. So uh, that's okay. so. Let me come to some examples. Uh, so if G is a reductive group, then it's not hard to see that there is only one admissible pair, namely uh, the H is the trivial group. So that's the only admissible pair. Uh, it's uh, it's not so hard to prove this. So basically. Uh, so what does conjecture two say in this case? In this case, conjecture two says that this category DG of G has no non-trivial idempotent. So basically we expect that, so corresponding to this admissible pair, the uh, corresponding idempotent is just delta one, which is the delta sheaf uh, supported at one. And this is of course the unit of DG of G. So for reductive group, conjecture two is equivalent to the claim that uh, there are no non-trivial idempotents in DG of G. By the way, this is still uh, open. So uh, as far as I know. But on the other hand, uh, there are lots of minimal idempotents on unipotent groups. And in fact, they corresponding, uh, correspond by bijectively with L packets. So if you have a unipotent group and F is a minimal idempotent on a unipotent group, then this F DG of G is in fact equivalent to the bounded derived category of a modular fusion category. So minimal idempotents already, so in case of unipotent groups, minimal idempotents already give the uh, loose stick packets and the L packet decomposition of character sheet. So this is the other extreme where, uh, so for reductive groups, there is I mean, at least conjecturally, there is only one minimal idempotent. On the other hand, for uh, unipotent groups, uh, uh, minimal idempotents correspond bijectively with uh, loose stick packets. So, uh, yeah, so this is the example that uh, Charlotte was mentioning. So, you look at the maximal uh, unipotent subgroup of SL3, which is the Heisenberg group. So the center of this is the GA uh, sitting in the top corner. And if you look at the quotient uh, U modulo Z, that's uh, GA uh, power two. Uh, so now if we fix a non-trivial character of Z mod PZ, we can identify the share dual of the additive group with itself. So uh, we will fix a non-trivial character of uh, the cyclic group of P elements and uh, uh, we fix such an identification. So then the stair dual of this center gets identified with GA and we can also see that the stair dual of 
u uh, is the same as shear dual of this v which is this uh, you know a ga2 uh, and so we also have such an identification uh, so we can uh, so in this case uh, let me define all the uh, i mean let me describe all the admissible pairs which give all the minimal idempotents so basically uh, these are the admissible pairs so basically on u uh, you have this l so uh, remember here that this u dual is ga2 so where uh, so here by l x comma y where we look at a point x comma y in ga2 so using this identification this is a multiplicative local system on u so basically these are these correspond to the one dimensional characters on the other hand uh, as charlotte mentioned if you look at this uh, z if you look at a non trivial uh, non trivial uh, multiplicative local system then this is a uh, admissible pair where so here z is non trivial so uh, ga minus 0 so uh, basically these give us all the minimal idempotents and in fact in this case uh, all the lustig packets are singleton for the for the heisenberg group so basically uh, the minimal idempotents that you get from these admissible pairs they are all the character sheets so they are precisely the character sheets so now let me come to a uh, an example of a solvable group so i look at the borel subgroup of sl3 so let me describe the admissible pairs for the borel subgroup so first you have the pair uh, uh, u uh, comma q uh, the trivial uh, multiplicative local system so the so the normalizer of this pair is of course all of b and so we can uh, look at the so the, of course uh, this gives rise to some minimal idempotent in db of b and if we look at the block of uh, db of b corresponding to this minimal idempotent then the multiplicative uh, so then uh, the lustig packets in this uh, Uh, corresponding to this minimal idempotent are parameterized by the multiplicative local systems on the uh, maximal torus p so basically there are uh, corresponding to this minimal idempotent there are as many l packets uh, as multiplicative local systems on this uh, maximal torus and in this case all the l packets are singleton uh, the second admissible pair i have is again the uh, unipotent group is u but now the multiplicative local system is l1 comma 0 where here uh, i'm uh, using this identification so a multiplicative local system i'm uh, on u can be identified with this uh, ga2 so uh, so uh, so here this l1 comma 0 uh, is with this identification so this l1 comma 0 is a multiplicative local system on u and the normalizer of this is uh, t1 comma 2 so t1 comma 2 is the torus where the first two uh, diagonal is the uh, i mean t1 2 is the uh, subgroup of t where the first two diagonal entries are equal and the uh, so corresponding to this admissible pair the l packets are also singleton and are parameterized by the set of multiplicative local systems on now this uh, t12 so similarly uh, the next admissible pair i have is u now l0 comma 1 and uh, the story is exactly the same here so instead of t12 you have now t23 and again all the l packets are singleton and 
the L packets corresponding to this item potent are again parameterized by the local systems on uh, GM. Uh, and now we can look at uh, the Z, which was the uh, uh, center of uh, U. So here the normalizer of this is T13U and uh, the story is somewhat similar for this. Uh, the corresponding L packets are uh, parameter, uh, they are all singleton and they are parameterized by the multiplicative local systems on uh, T, oh sorry, it should be T13, there is a typo here, so this should be T13. Uh, and uh, finally, we have this admissible pair where now we go back to U, which is uh, the unipotent radical of D. And the multiplicative local system is the generic one. So this is uh, L1, comma 1. And the normalizer of this is, uh, so mu3 is the uh, group of third ro roots of unity. And so, yeah, so yeah, so the, uh, so the normalizer of uh, this pair is this, and uh, there is a, uh, there is only one L packet corresponding to this uh, minimal item potent, and this L L packet in fact has uh, nine character sheets, and the modular fusion category will in fact be the uh, Drinfield double of this uh, mu three. So, so. So, uh, we have this so uh, but uh, so there is uh, just one packet but it has nine character sheets in one l packet so uh, now let me just see uh, uh, let me just try to convince you that uh, how we can reduce to the heisenberg case so so in the heisenberg case let's recall what do we have so this means that uh, all of G normalizes this pair. So let U be the unipotent radical of G and uh, G red the reductive uh, quotient. So of course this can be disconnected. So, uh, so G red is, so this acts on the commutative unipotent group U mod H. We have the uh, G red equivariant Q symmetric isogeny. That was uh, uh, there in the definition of high, uh, admissible pairs, uh, U mod H to this. Uh, and let's call the kernel of this isogeny KL. So this is a finite P group. And in fact, whenever you, you have, we have a skew symmetric isogeny, we can define a quadratic form on the kernel of this isogeny. So uh, if you look at just the uh, unipotent radical u and this uh, so uh, basically uh, let me uh, not uh, say much about the right hand side here but let me just say that this category is the bounded derived category of some very explicit uh, modular fusion category so this m k l comma theta is a certain modular fusion category which can be described using this uh, quadratic form and we have an equivalence of graded monoidal categories and moreover uh, so basically we want to study this uh, so el is a heisenberg idempotent and we want to define character sheaves in this category so this in some sense can be thought of as a twisted version of the bounded derived category of the reductive quotient so, uh, and uh, finally, let me say that, uh, so our goal was to prove uh, conjecture one, which uh, says that, uh, which was about the existence of character sheaves and the properties that the set of character sheaves is supposed to satisfy. So, uh, so then we have that the conjecture one would follow if we can prove conjecture two prime, Namely, we can prove that the this braided monoidal category that we have here has no non-trivial idempotence. So this is what is needed 
and secondly we should also prove that uh, so we should define character sheaves in this category and prove an analog of conjecture one for uh, this category so so basically uh, uh, so i claim that if we uh, so basically these two statements are just about the heisenberg case and conjecture one in general would follow if we can prove these two statements about the heisenberg case uh, and let me just add that uh, uh, so let's look at the heisenberg case so the character sheaves in el dg of g i expect that the character sheaves here should be perverse sheaves so at least for solvable groups in the heisenberg idempotent case the character sheaves are perverse Uh, but let me just try to go back to uh, this equivalence here. So we expect so uh, so here. So uh, let's say we have something Heisenberg here, and then we are inducing. So we expect the character sheaves here to be perverse. But the thing is, this induction functor doesn't preserve uh, perversity. So that that is the reason why we don't expect. Uh, perverse sheaves. Uh, so uh, we don't expect uh, character sheaves to be perverse uh, uh, on a general group. However, we do expect character sheaves to be perverse in this uh, Heisenberg case. So I think I'll uh, stop here. All Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions? Can I ask a question? Yes. Sir. Uh, so, uh, so in the example of uh, um, the Borel in SL3, um, yeah. which um, so which of these um, uh, list of sheaves are not perverse? So, uh, so I think if you look at uh, Uh, so if you look at the let's say the last one uh -huh. uh, these will not be perverse suppose the first one will be perverse so so uh, so uh, maybe except the first case none of the four other cases would be perverse because each of these steps uh, i mean involves some induction because the in each of the cases the normalizer is uh, strictly smaller Ah, okay. So, uh, so maybe in all these cases, uh, the character sheets are not perverse. I I see. Uh, okay. And another question is in the um, so for solvable groups, uh, the this transition matrix between uh, Frobenius trace functions of character sheaves and irreducible yes. characters. Um, So, what's the nature of such matrices? Uh, are they still related to non-abelian Fourier transform? Uh, yes. Uh, so, specifically, if, uh, so let me just go back to. So, so the, the so this last point here. So, if you have a if you have a modular fusion category. Uh, there is an S matrix associated to this, and if you have a modular fusion category along with a modular auto equivalence, then there is a notion of a crossed S matrix. Uh -huh. So, uh, so basically, this uh, Frobenius, so pullback by Frobenius, is going to give this. Uh, so, of course, this result is uh, known for uh, solvable groups. So pullback. Uh, so for solvable group, this uh, pullback by Frobenius it gives an auto equivalence of this modular category, and then this transition matrix can be defined as uh, can be uh, is equal to the uh, this cross S matrix that can be defined. So and this uh, so this uh, non-abelian Fourier transform is uh, so again this is some. Uh, special case of this crossed s matrices 
Ah. Oh, okay. For okay. example, uh, if you have a finite group and a the Tinfield double of this finite group, mm -hmm. then there is an S matrix associated to that. Or you could also look at a finite group uh, equipped with an automorphism. So that would be uh, an analog of this uh, uh, modular fusion category equipped with a uh, modular autonomy. Okay, thank you. But uh, so, hello, I think, can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so I think that uh, there's a simple example when, when so solvable group can take this AX plus B group as two dimensional solvable group. Yes. And we, uh, which is simple, and in that case, there is a, a, a representation of dimension Q minus one, which which uh, character looks like cannot be associated with any perverse shift. Yes, 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 so yes. Huh? Yes, yes, yes. So that's that's yes, that's, that, yes that character shift. Yeah, it's uh, yes, but still, uh, uh, so yes, it's not associated with the perverse shift. Yes, that's right. But for for unipotent groups, uh, I think I think it's it, it, it they yes. always perverse shifts. It, it's yes, for shift. unipotent groups, it is always perverse. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So George, for in the, that unipo example, how do you how can you tell from the character that it doesn't look like it would come from a a, a perverse shift? Uh, because uh, it, the character is uh, uh, so it is. Uh, on a group, I think it is uh, some co co some very some root of unity everywhere except at one point where it's where it's Q or something Q something uh, so so it, it jumps at one point so it doesn't, it doesn't look like perverse shift. Ah, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, thanks. So if it was yeah, if it was perverse shift, it should have the opposite behavior. So it should should be with Q. Uh, at, uh, well, it should be Q at one point, so, so it should be uh, no, anyway. So this, this is not a. This looks like two, two, two. Looks like two yeah. perverse shifts somehow. Yes. Uh, put together. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. So I mean, there is. So in this case, if you sort of look at the. Thick triangulated subcategory generated by this uh, by this uh, sheaf. Uh, it has uh, a certain uh, T structure which is not the perverse T structure, and uh, it is in the heart of that T structure, which is not perverse. But also, I also remember. That for unipotent group, this the first example when there is uh, non-trivial is L packet. Yes. Is SP4 over yes, yes. Kazik 2. Kazik 2. I think yes, yes, yes. Yes. some examples I, I found. I think yes, this, yes, was, yes. this was oh, yes. this, this this example, I think, that you suggested to Drinfeld and Boyachenko. Yes, yes. Uh, and Drinfeld was ex uh, motivated by this, uh, this, ex this yeah. example. So when he developed this theory of characteristics, this uh, this was the motivation. Uh, yes, the, so in that, that case, the, the L packet has four four objects. Four, uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes. Like the, yeah, so double, double yes. yes. <clears throat> but in, in, in large, if you take an important group, in large characteristics, all L packets are have a single object. Yes. 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 Mm. yes only all small characteristics. Yes. So, in general, so for unipotent groups, it, if it happens that the uh, the centralizer of if the centralizer of each element is connected, then all the uh, L packets will be trivial. Yeah. 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 So I want to say thank you again to Tanmay and thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate the 
effort to make this so so clear to us from so far away. Uh, I remind you that next week, I believe uh, Carl Mautner will speak to us from Dartmouth. So it's about 400 times easier for him. We'll, we'll see. Um, and I don't yet have a title for that, but I'll put one up on the seminar website as soon as I can. So thank you very much. And good evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.